Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Helen He. I work in the NERSC user engagement group. Um, I, like Austin said, I used to be in the scientific computing group with him many years ago. Um, I have um, my, my main duty is user consulting, training, um, and documentation. All these are work that helps our users. So I've been giving this um, training introduction to those resources talk uh, for a few years now in the student summer students program. Um, in the last couple of years, we opened this training also to our new users, uh, not just students. So today when I talk about this, uh, I understand that our attendees pool is pretty large. There are users in um, students pretty new to HPC. And so, and there are also many users that are very advanced um, in HPC, but although new to NERSC. So the idea for today is that I will introduce lots of um, information and that re relevant to um, navigating NERSC resources. And some of the topics might be uh, like not interesting to everyone, but the idea is to like touch lots of aspects so that you know from after this, you'll be able to know where to find information that you need. And it is a really um, compact talk with hands-on already original planned. However, we don't have access to the perimeter system today because of the urgent need of the maintenance. Um, um, but I have put all the scripts, example scripts and out, uh, sample output in the GitHub repo for hands-on with README so we could look at this together at the end of the session. Um, and let's start with some logistics first. Uh, we muted everyone, but I would hope that you could rename your name, rename um, in Zoom so that we know who you are to click on the participants, then more next to your name to rename to first name, last name. We have enabled the caption so you can toggle on and off with the CC button. And also uh, you could view, you can also choose view for transcript if you like to. Um, we have, let's post again this uh, Google Doc link. Uh, it's good for the Google Doc that we could have in, not the, the questions and st saved after Zoom and also not um, having the interleaved um, effect as in Zoom chat. We will post slides, slides and videos after the training event on the nurse training events page and on the summer student page. Um, the applying the training account, um, we at this point, because we, I said we, we may not have access to the 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 um, promoter today, but if you still don't have a training account after the training, you're welcome to apply for one and you could use the um, account until next um, training and one week after next training on June 22nd on um, uh, crash course in supercomputing. You can use the same training account for that event as well. So what I'm going to talk about is uh, systems overview and where you can find various NERSC resources, how to connect to NERSC, um, the file system, the data management transfer, some software environments, building applications, and especially on running jobs, so a little bit more details there. And I'll introduce data analytics software and services. And then the last topic is the compiling and running jobs and perimeter with the hands-on exercises. Um, Um, excuse me. You may have the summer students today may have already heard Rebecca's talk this morning, uh, introducing NERSC. But for all other new users of NERSC, just very briefly, NERSC is the Mission HPC Computing Center uh, for the DOE Office of Science. Um, we have approximately nine thousand users, nine hundred projects, uh, lots of applications per year. <clears throat> so. Um, NERSC is a division at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, a, a DOE uh, facility. So you can see that our research uh, having lots of um, um, aspects. For example, uh, these are the DOE programs offices each day are uh, also responsible for allocating hours for our NERSC users. We have basic scientific computing research, biology, environmental research, basic energy, fusion, high energy physics, nuclear physics, et cetera. Here's our NERSC systems uh, roadmap. About every three to five, four years, uh, we have a new system uh, on the floor. 
very recently, actually, uh, as of yesterday, query access to all users were disabled yesterday and was officially uh, retired a week ago with a, a mini core CPU system. And the current major system parameter is CPU and GPU uh, computational system. And NERSC 10 uh, uh, call for uh, requisition has already been working ongoing and for vendors already working on our uh, proposal uh, responses. And so NERSC will be evaluating the NERSC vendor responses and um, having a next NERSC 10 system on our store, on, our, on the floor a few years later. Here's our systems map. As I mentioned, Corey has just been retired. Uh, so I'm just, we will focus on Parameter today. Parameter has 1,500 A100 um, a GPU nodes uh, with four GPUs per node and a CPU on the node as well. <clears throat> There's also, um, uh, I forgot the number, um, so many, many CPU nodes, you'll see the, um, uh, in, in another, another slide. It has the uh, CPU uh, memory, for 384 terabytes CPU memory, 240 GPU memory. It is um, connected with the Cray Slingshot high-speed interconnect. Um, I think it's the seventh most powerful computer um, in the recent uh, top 500 list. And then we also have surrounding um, surrounding configurations, um, the, the like Ethernet, um, high perform uh, the um, Ethernet connection to other outside of the NERSC. We also have lots of storage systems, common file system, and uh, long-term long storage, HPSS storage as well. So uh, the next section, I just want to introduce you all possible uh, online resources that you may be encounter, need to encounter. So first of all, we have a classic NERSC page. So www.nersc.gov. Um, you can find signs and news or publications, how to contact us. There's also live status, um, message of the day. So you'll find out system status and you'll find NERSC user, in, NERSC user group information um, and uh, Slack, that we have a user Slack. We, I'll, I'll introduce that in another slide. And most importantly, just want to mention to you, we have the training events webpage and the we have about 20 to 30-ish um, trainings per year and on various topics, new users, how to use systems, GPUs, programming models, performance uh, tools, applications, data analytics, machine learning, deep learning, workflow, and everything. So feel free to explore all these um, trainings here. We have major almost all of them with slides and videos available. Uh, you can find the link from each of the events there. So to just to mention that one of the training, also part of the summer student um, program is the crash course in supercomputing. So if you are new to high performance computing, if you don't know what MPI and OpenMP are, um, be sure to register for this um, event. Um, this is the like base skeleton for um, we do a parallel simulation on supercomputing systems. And training accounts for today, you can still continue to use for that one. Uh, as I mentioned, on the training events, we have the recordings um, available. They're actually published on the NERSC YouTube channel. So you can find um, the playlists and just explore. <laughs> and user Slack, as I mentioned, we have an uh, on user Slack uh, uh, sponsored by NERSC user group. Uh, it's on so not officially by NERSC, but NERSC, lots of NERSC staff will be participating. And uh, the goal for this is for users helping users. So you can join if you haven't and ask questions, but officially you, if you have a ticket, uh, the ticket system is still the official channel to ask uh, questions to NERSC staff. We also have a uh, NERSC uh, user appointments it's about a half an hour appointment that you can schedule and on various topics and you can schedule which topic and to with which staff member. The all the technical documentations on, on this site, NERSC docs, docs.nurse.gov. On the left side is the, the topics. So that's all the topics that are listed here. 
um, getting started is especially important for new users. Um, and you can find links to various topics uh, for, for other. Running jobs is, is probably uh, also uh, most accessed. There's an example jobs page there. Uh, of course, there's a, are there questions? Okay. Let's start it. Uh, then IRS page is the account management and reporting. So if you're a new user, uh, if you, even if uh, so you can find um, from IRS your account information, change your password. Also, if you have a, a regular NERSC account, you need to set up the multi-factor authentication there, uh, following instructions. You can also check usage information of your project, of your own uh, jobs, et cetera. Mm. Um, help portal is where users um, submit tickets to us. You can find all your tickets and you can open a ticket to open a new ticket. And you can find all your recent tickets, your own recent tickets. You can find your projects um, open tickets. There's also an open request. When you click that, you can find a list of forms that you can request, such as like quota increase, compute node reservations, et cetera. Also, there's a link to um, book consulting appointment. And here, uh, book consulting appointment, uh, NERSC user Slack, you can click there and access to the IRS as well here. There's also a, <clears throat> a site called My NERSC. If you log in and there's a dashboard, you can find your personal disk usage and you can find uh, jobs, not in your jobs and all other users' jobs as well. You can find um, a list of other things. So I want to actually show you the, the next slide. Uh, which we are mentioned that um, it's a, it has also uh, links to many other places. Like here I mentioned, you can check your Discord. There's also on the right-hand side, it's like you check system status if it's permanent up. You can find all your jobs. And here you go to nurse homepage. It's the, the classic webpage, documentations portal. The account is Iris. And there's also JupTub. Lots of users using JupTub to um, instead of SSH to access our system and do many other things in, on the JupyterHub as well. And, and the service tickets is the help portal that you can submit uh, tickets at as well. Mm. I just also want to mention to you, um, the Perlmutter documentation, go to systems and um, there's Perlmutter and Corey has been retired, but so majority is yeah. information here. There's a running jobs on Perlmutter. There's also <clears throat> a performance section called parameter readiness. This is the <clears throat> accumulated knowledge. When we start to put our helping users put um, user jobs onto the GPU nodes. So there's lots of uh, programming models information and, and um, case studies for applications. So be sure to check that out. Are there any questions, Charles? One question is how long what does the training account last or if it will expire? So uh, presumably we won't need to use training account during the session, but yeah, feel, please feel free to apply for one after the session. Or if you are um, students or new NERSC users, you should apply also apply for a general NERSC account and set up MFA. Helen, you're muted. Sorry. <laughs> so let's talk about connecting to NERSC. Um, as I mentioned, a multi-factor authentication is needed. So you'll be using your regular NERSC password plus a one-time password. Sorry, I'm muted to cough. You can set up with a Google Authenticator app or the RC that is follow the instructions on our NERSC website. So, uh, <clears throat> so we also have a, a script that helps you to 
overcome the, uh, the inconvenience of to you have to type password every time. So as set up SSH, SSH proxy allows you to type one pa password once every 24 hours only. So once that is set up, all the NERSC websites are logging to serve on um, this computational systems. Um, you don't need to task type a uh, password for an, another 24 hours. So be sure to set that set that as set SSH proxy up as well. <clears throat> so you would type um, SSH L Elvis, your username at portmurder.nursk.gov, or actually you could do saw.nursk.gov. Saw is the first name of Saw Portmurder that our system is named after. He's a, a lab scientist, oh. one Nobel Prize. <laughs> then you type your password plus one time password um, on one line, but once you set up. <coughs> Is this proxy or the training account as well? You don't need to type past the OTP. The password itself is sufficient. <clears throat> and if you need X forwarding, use dash Y flag. With that, then after you uh, um, say invoke some um, of the application that needs GUI, uh, dash Y will allow you to have the X forwarding. However, um, regular X forwarding is not fast enough if you are far away from the lab. So we're um, recommending to use NX. NX stands for no machine. So you need to download an NX client, uh, follow the instructions on this website, connect.nx, and then on <clears> the <throat> access page, you would type username and the uh, OTP one-time password in one line. <clears throat> This is the session how it looks like. You have a regular NX, or you could also have SS proxy NX. And then uh, you, you see this page, and this, this thing button is actually Perlmutter. You click that, you're logged into Perlmutter. Uh, the <clears throat> added benefit for no machine is not only X forwarding being much more efficient, but also if you like lost connection and to internet, or you closed your laptop, and when you come back, you will be uh, coming back to the exact session that you left with. Um, as connecting to NERSC, there's another way using Jupyter Hub. So jupyter.nurse.gov. Again, use um, username and password and then OTP. And then there's a kernel called terminal. When you click that, you get a terminal um, inside Jupyter Hub. This is like you're already logged into the NERSC on, on Perlmutter and you have a, a session just like SSH, SSH access. Any questions? If you have any is issues using NX, using a SSH MFA, uh, open a ticket and our consultants will help you. So if not, uh, next section is about file systems and man data management. Hmm. This is very simplified NERSC file systems. Um, and the channel, uh, the, the arrows here from bottom to up, it's performance on long-term storage. I think uh, we have somebody not muted. Could someone mute yourself, please? Um, oh, Charles, you can check uh, to mute um, attendee, please. And we also have community file system and then local scratch on Perlmutter and then memory on the um, compute nodes. <clears throat> capacity is um, in growing from the other direction. We also have, have a global home. This is where you logging and <clears throat> and and the global common as was where we have lots of our global common um, software that NERSC store installed. And also we would also encourage users to install software there that has read only access on compute nodes. So that's much um, performance better when <clears throat> you when there's no need to write. Um, for your software. So quickly, global file, global file system, home is permanent, um, it's 40 gigabytes storage quota for everyone. And it's not tuned for running uh, parallel jobs or large IO jobs. <clears throat> we do have a snapshot um, backup, so you could retrieve seven day history in, if it accidentally uh, files got lost. It's good for storage your data and so such as source codes and shell scripts, et cetera. 
<clears throat> community file system is um, good for shares use you uh, share <clears throat> files um, within your uh, among your project members and it's also permanent and much larger storage performance wise is uh, between global home and your scratch file systems it, uh, it does also have a snapshot snapshot so, the local version scratch um, is very large for temporary storage. It's great for when you run your jobs out of scratch, but make sure you back up important files because uh, there's, first of all, they're not backed up. Also, it's uh, data on scratch file system are subject to purge. A purge policy is uh, if you files not <clears throat> have access for eight weeks or potentially maybe uh, purged. Um, long-term storage, uh, HPSS. So there are uh, two tools, HSI and HTAR. HTAR is very similar to regular Linux TAR, except <clears throat> there's no um, intermediate file stored on the computational system. It'll put your, it'll TAR up your files and directly put onto HPSS, which is the recommended way to use H HPSS. HSI is for uh, archives uh, single, files. So um, the, the larger the file to be um, archived, the better performance it is. That's why um, HTAR is more recommended. <clears throat> um, any questions so far? Not um, Charles, you can interrupt me if there's a question you want me to repeat, even if you answered. Mm. Will do. Yeah. So <clears throat> Next section is about software environment and building applications. So our, the supercomputer OS is a one kind of version of Linux as is a not a full, full version, but it's a stripped down-ish. Um, all the compilers are provided. Also NERSC provided lots of libraries, um, tools library and applications library or app as well. We have lots of chemistry, material science packages uh, pre-built that you can use. We also have a uh, DOE extreme scale, extreme scale scientific software stack uh, with hundreds of packages that you can also um, use. We use a modules environment. The modules like you have uh, modules for each individual packages or libraries. And then once you do module load, uh, it'll, it'll provide the environment for that library or package um, available, such as the pass or library pass into onto your uh, local environment. <clears throat> so it's um, easy to manipulate. You can load and unload and clean up the modules you don't need, for example. So these are the little, uh, a few of the commonly used module commands, module list to see all the modules in your environment. Module spider is a way to find um, if such a <clears throat> module is available, for example, you say module spider net CDF, it'll list all the available modules um, and how to load them with the net CDF as a module name in as a substring in the module name. You can load and unload the module. You could swap from one version to another version, for example, or from even from Intel to GCC, for example. <clears throat> There's a module show, a module display to see uh, what a module loads and what the environment settings this module will do and what is on help with the more information of the modules and <clears throat> for example. So we have a documentation of modules environment. Uh, if, you, if you're not familiar to modules, this is uh, more, it becomes more and more standard in the uh, HPC uh, environment management um, supercomputers. <clears throat> and if you were a Cori user, uh, the difference for Parameter is that Cori used the Tico module and uh, Parameter used LMOT, although they are very similar in usage. So the default modules loaded at logging on Parameter is the GPU environment. So you can see this, we have a GPU module loaded. Along with that, we have a few GPU related part modules uh, such as CUDA Toolkit and Cray Excel and Video 80, which is the target architecture of our GPU nodes. And with this set, <clears throat> these are set by default and loaded. <clears throat> also a module sets the MPitch GPU support enabled to be one. 
and I color coded. Um, this is the GPU architecture, and this is the CPU architecture. <clears throat> so if you actually want to build on G CPU architecture, the GPU setting won't affect you, presumably. And um, by default, we also load the uh, MPI library and scientific library here. You'll notice this uh, module called PRG ENV GNU, which is the default environment, meaning uh, <clears throat> we are under GNU environment with GCC um, also loaded by default. So the MPI and Cray side is actually <clears throat> having the um, G GCC built libraries also as part of a loaded environment. Uh, we have some other compilers environment available, um, like the Cray environment and NVIDIA environment. And if you do module load prgenv nvidia you will still see mpitch and lib libsci loaded. However, underneath those library have been swapped uh, using the, <clears throat> the other compiler uh, built and libraries already. So this is the loaded by default. And uh, if you uh, need to build applications for GPU, you don't need to, you know, just use these uh, modules loaded as part of your environment. Um, if you want to build for CPU only, presumably, like I said, GPU module loaded should not affect you um, CPU usage, but we still recommend you do a module load CPU, which will remove all of the previously loaded GPU modules. So it's a clean, clean environment. Um, again, you have the CPU architecture and uh, the um, program environment and stuff, and you see uh, you have a CPU uh, module here. So as I mentioned, we have a few different compilers. Uh, the first three are provided by, uh, also the environment um, are provided by vendors and the Intel is uh, managed by NERSC staff. <clears throat> With all these uh, compilers, uh, you will be using native, um, the compiler wrappers. <clears throat> oh, I, I think, um, so, so the compiler wrappers are FTN for Fortran, little cc for C and capital CC for C++. So which, whichever compiler uh, or program environment you use for all four of these, you should not use native compilers, but use these uh, compiler wrappers to build your applications. So when you use compiler wrappers, it'll link, if your application calls MPI, it'll link the MPI libraries for you automatically. It also links scientific libraries because you see there those modules were loaded at at default logging. And if you say you call um, create net CDF module, it all, the wrappers will also recognize and put the net CDF um, library needed to uh, the libraries and include files along with the <clears throat> FTN, uh, the uh, compiler wrappers usage. So this is very convenient. And we uh, applications built on Perlmutter is dynamically built by default. Just to mention this, and static boot is not supported on our system. So here's a very simple example. <clears throat> so if you want to build a CPU, you would module load CPU first, then our default uh, compiler is GNU. And if an MPI code, you all just do FTN. <clears throat> if it's a hybrid MPI and OpenMP code, you would add a flag dash F OpenMP. <clears throat> And if you want to use NVIDIA compiler, you would module load PRG NV NVIDIA first. Now you're under um, the MP NVIDIA environment. The command for uh, build MPI is the same. For um, hybrid MPI OpenMP, the flag is different. It's dash MP instead of F OpenMP for GCC. And M dash MP is uh, for NVIDIA compiler. <coughs> I also wanted to show you um, the list of compilers and different com programming models on GPU that are supported on um, Perlmutter. The green colors are vendor supported and um, brownish colors are um, in NERSC supported and in um, progress. <clears throat> NVIDIA support, NVIDIA compiler supports a uh, majority of the programming models, GNU as well, and uh, <clears throat> LLVM uh, also supports HIP and DCP++ and SQL. So uh, lots of uh, performance portability models that you can use with various compilers on Perlmutter. 
The performance readiness page I mentioned earlier has lots of documentations on how to use these compilers, how to use these uh, performance programming models as well. And also on the training um, events page, you will find lots of trainings uh, towards all the uh, programming models. <clears throat> so you want to build a CUDA program on GPU um, with load GPU module, or if you log in and the GPU module is already loaded. And here is the used GNU compiler. You can just, just use wrapper to build directly. And if we want to use a NVIDIA compiler to build a CUDA code, you would add a dash CUDA flag um, along with using the compiler wrapper. Um, if you want to build an open MP offload code on the GPU, again, load GPU. <clears throat> if it's already loaded, you don't have to. <clears throat> and um, open MP offload is best supported by NVIDIA compiler and CCE. Um, it is supported um, with GCC compiler, although the performance uh, currently is not uh, comparable with the NVIDIA and CCE. So I'm only showing you these. Um, for uh, NVIDIA compiler, you would load PRG NV and the flag becomes dash MP equals GPU instead of just dash MP for the CPU. <clears throat> and for the CCE compiler, um, the command is different for its Fortran compiler and its C, C++ compiler. So you'll see the flags are different um, as shown here. This is because their um, compiler base is uh, um, different to tracks. The Fortran is still the CCE classic and the C, C++ is uh, now LLM, LLVM compiler based. <clears throat> I already mentioned uh, these pages here, the performance readiness and compiling and building software. So uh, just section done. <laughs> there are some questions in chat. Should I be worried about them? No, we're handling them. Um, I. Do you want to bring those questions, copy them over to Google Doc? So we have a... Yeah, yeah, and, we are. Uh, if you need me to answer, uh, you, are you answering them already? Okay, great. Yeah, Thank we're you. answering them. Yeah, you Thanks can so continue. Much, Charles and Nippy. So we talked, let's talk about running jobs. So most jobs here are parallel jobs, but also we have the high throughput uh, serial jobs at NERSC. Um, for data simulation, for HPC data, data, I think, um, analytics <clears throat> work as well. Um, so we have a batch scheduler called Slurm, and we use batch mode. The jobs, uh, the jobs are not first, first in, first come. The scheduler would deal with, uh, to be fair, like if a user submits 1,000 jobs, shouldn't be running before another user just submit two jobs. <clears throat> So they log two different types of nodes, logging nodes and compute nodes. Formula has CPU and GPU compute nodes. So your jobs um, processing uh, large um, data or doing large simulations all should be running on the compute nodes, not on logging nodes. So logging nodes, what you do is submit batch jobs. You would do a submit a job to a batch queue, or you could submit an interactive batch with S alloc. S batch submit a job script to the queue. S alloc submit an interactive batch job, and you would be able to get a, an instance response uh, on a compute node. And so you can do interactive uh, computing, but you're still running on compute nodes. <clears throat> so once you get a hand landed on the uh, first node, you'll be landing on the called it's called uh, the head node you will be on head compute node. Then all the things you type um, in your batch script, except those srun commands will actually be running on the head compute node. Then you would launch an srun command, which will um, allocate your job, um, distribute your job onto the all the compute nodes that got allocated to your uh, node, to, to your job, via your um, job script. I'll show you some examples here. Very first, my hello uh, for hello world exam. Here's a batch script you would prepare uh, separately. And once you have this batch script, you would ask batch my batch script. So inside the batch script, there are some key parameters you need to set, uh, which queue you want to submit to. Here are examples using debug. There are also like regular and uh, many other queues. 
And also you would ask how many nodes I need. The S batch is always a keyword and you have different parameters. This example shows a short, ver short version option. There are also long version options like dash n would become dash dash nodes equals two. But here, basically you need to ask for how many nodes you want. What is what time your job needs? 10 minutes here. And what um, computational architecture you need to submit to? Dash capital C CPU submit to CPU compute nodes. And dash dash capital C GPU is submit to uh, run on GPU nodes. Um, these two I commented out is optional um, for your job name and what file system your job will be using. Then you have an S run command uh, with how many tasks you will need to run your application. There's some other flags. Uh, this is a very simple flag. There are other flags I'll show in the next slide. But then um, those S batch script, or um, as I mentioned, to run with interactive batch, you would do S alloc uh, with you know similar flags here, CPU node 10 minutes, but also if you want to interact batch, uh, you could still do dash Q debug, but uh, it's recommended to use interactive QoS, which will get a node faster than debug. <clears throat> so after you get on node, you just can type this one on the compute node with inside, within inside interactive batch. For all the batch jobs, so you submit and you just wait and uh, you can you go back to your um, directory to see if you have output yet, or there's some uh, monitoring uh, queues and commands. You can see if your job, list of your jobs and their status. I quickly want to show you a CPU compute node. Um, this is a parameter CPU compute node, one node. On each node, it has two sockets. And on each socket has two NUMA, uh, it has four NUMA domains. Each NUMA domain, um, local, the basically what it means is memory access from within the new local new domain is faster than memory access to for the CPUs to need to access memory from a remote new domain. <clears throat> also, you can see that I have like numbers here, 0, 128. So you can see um, on each socket, there are um, Six, each socket has 64 cores. The black ones numbers meaning the physical core, there's 64 physical cores. So on the whole node, there are 128 physical cores. And each physical core has two um, hyper thread, or we call them logical cores. So the whole node has 256 logical cores. And the core zero physical core and the logical core 128 is actually the two hyper threads on this physical core. So just have these numbers in, in has some uh, stored somewhere because when we do the affinity exercise, we want to know from the output to check back which whether my um, job or my, my process are binded to the correct cores and so that we were not getting some Newman node memory access penalty. The way to um, obtain the process information is you get on the compute node with S alloc and there are a few commands you can run to find out all the information then then from those i uh, generate this plot just for scheme schema uh, diagram so here's another uh, sample back job script <clears throat> now i have many nodes so um, and then i would say if i want to run how many tasks per node? Normally you would run um, MPI tasks. There are some other programming models, not MPI, but mostly you'll be running MPI tasks. And then, so for this example, if you end 40 and then how many total uh, ends up with 32 total M uh, MPI tasks per node. And for the running jobs, first of all, we want to let you to put in dash dash CPU by an equals course along with a dash C flag. And the way how to calculate dash C flag is by total number of 250 logical CPUs divided by uh, 32 MPI tasks per node ends up with eight. If you're not setting these things correctly, you're, you're being getting lots of penalties and the, the binding or process or affinity bindings is bad and your performance like, well, you, you may end up with uh, multiple <clears throat> process. Um, some of the idle, some of the cores are idle and some of the uh, process may be oversubscribed, which will slow down your jobs significantly. So both of these are, are critical settings. Uh, here's a hybrid MPI OpenMP job. And 
you would um, set up some of the OpenMP num threads uh, or some of the OpenMP settings. And then the, the, the key is very similar, how many, um, find out how many MPI tasks per node and find out what the C should be. Again, with 256 divided by this eight number, you get 32 here in this example. <clears throat> and the number of OpenMP threads value should be smaller than however many um, logical cores to be assigned to uh, each MPI task. So dash C means dash how many CPUs per task. And this CPU is in the concept of a Slurm scheduler. Slurm sees every single logical CPU as a CPU. So you're assigning um, 32 logical CPUs per MPI tasks so that your open MP number of threads value should be smaller than that. Um, if you're not familiar with MPI OpenMP at this point, it's okay. Um, you will join this uh, uh, training session in a couple of weeks. And here is just um, showing you how to run these jobs. And, and in that session, you will learn the concepts of those programming models. You also have hands-on to write some of these um, codes as programming codes in those models as well. Um, <clears throat> quickly showing you, so on, um, I showed you all the uh, ProModel CPU nodes, complete CPU nodes. There are also CPU node on the GPU node. So for those CPU on the GPU nodes, it has only zero, uh, only one socket instead of two socket. So the total number becomes half of, of the, uh, the CPU on ProModel versus the pure uh, CPU nodes. So when you run um, <clears throat> real applications, you will do, um, you have still lots of programming done on the CPU side, with uh, plus the um, offload um, programming on the GPU. So the CPU side, you will still do the similar um, affinity settings with the the dash C and dash uh, dash CPU bind settings, except now your base is half of um, the pure CPU node. So the quick concept of process affinity memory is that you want to make sure your process is uh, MPI tasks, your, um, you would first do um, distribute your MPI tasks onto, as even as possible on the nodes. Um, since there are eight uh, NUMA domains on each node, you would want to do eight MPI tasks at, at least. And then once your um, MPI tasks are allocated, on top of that, when you spawn open MP threads, you want the open MP threads also get uh, correct thread affinity. And for memory affinity, the concept is that um, memory access from two uh, further away NUMA domains costs more than local NUMA domains. So with these settings and OpenMP settings and, and shown earlier, um, we are helping you to taking care of these already. We also have some um, already built binaries for, uh, for you to replace uh, your own application with your batch script so you can set you can check uh, binary uh, affinity settings correctly before you run your own application this is basically a very low hanging fruit of getting performance but also it's it's so critical that it's the base for you continue doing more further um, optimization um so i i mention all these uh, running jobs on CPU, then I want to tell you a little bit more about debug and interactive. I already mentioned dash dash Q interactive. You could do dash Q debug as well. Uh, it gives you a little bit uh, more number of nodes that allowed, but also only up to 30 minutes. For the interactive, um, there's a limit of four nodes in four hours. And uh, you can you will wait up to six minutes. And if you don't get a node, um, it'll exit. So it's it's very convenient. Uh, as I mentioned, we do have lots of uh, users still running serial jobs. So for serial jobs, if it takes the whole node, it's a big waste of resources. So we have a shared QoS um, implemented that you you can use only partial node. So you'll only be also be charged by partial node. So you can just so usually with the serial code, uh, you don't need to use SRAM because you will be running as a serial executable. So just uh, your executable, executable name here is enough uh, with little memory requirements or, the, or you can use how many cores you need with a little dash N flag. <clears throat> and you could also bundle your jobs, meaning you can run multiple S runs within a single batch script. There are two ways. One way is to you need to run them one by one after another. So if you want to do that, just make sure you're um, 
time asked for is the summation of uh, each of the individual S runs. There's another way to uh, bundle them to run three S runs or multiple S runs simultaneously. What you do is you put n percent on each S run and a weight. If you forget to that to do that, your first job will finish and then and the batch script will um, exit. For this to run simultaneously, you need to make sure the number of nodes you asked for is the summation of each individual S run um, that you need. <clears throat> so there are also some application you need to have dependencies in their job chain, such as uh, climate jobs, like, and you finish one, because the, the maximum water time has never been sufficient for a long, long um, simulation of climate studies, for example. So some of the dependency ways to do this is you have two ways. For example, you want, if you submit a job first and then the second job, you could say, I want to only start my job after the first job is successfully run. So that's after OK and the job ID. Or you could say, I just, I would launch my job to no matter, as long as the first one finishes, then it's just after any with a job ID. You can put in an S batch command, or you could put in your uh, batch script uh, with similar flag here. So Helen, we do have one good question um, okay. on recommendations for determining um, the computational cost for your job. What do you, uh, would you recommend? <clears throat> So this is really um, application dependent, especially the, what your application and your input. So the we, what we recommend is for users to do some small experiments and try to find a sweet spot. It, you would also experiment, um, you know, number of nodes and the number of MPI tasks, OpenMP, even with uh, and you would you know even with well, with without turning on hyperthreads, you can use only one one core per node. Per physical core, you could use two cores per physical core. So the idea is to do lots of small experiments. So you have a better understanding of your application to try to minimize, minimize the computational cost and maximize throughput. Some of the um, nurse provided applications, for, for example, VASP, we do have some like benchmarks data available, so you could reference those. But for your own applications, it really depends on each application set up and, and right. And if you're working with, um, if your research mentor has worked with the code that you'll be using before, okay. they should be able to give you some approximations on, you know, expected time based off of the, the data set and the number of tasks you'll use as well. Thank you, Ellen. Okay. And also just to tell you about job arrays. Job arrays is for you to um, easily manage a set of jobs that has very similar um, setup. For example, it'll give you a, a certain array job ID. So you could use to, this ID to set up uh, each individual subdirectories and you're putting different input data in it. So, <clears throat> so you have like 10 jobs here, for example. And once you submit it, each array jobs inside the batch queue, they are considered as independent jobs uh, by the scheduler. So they may be scheduled um, uh, independently, but you can still manage uh, array jobs. Like if you want um, yeah, cancel all of them, you can use just one command, one line to command to um, cancel all of them. Workflow uh, management. So idea is if you have say a thousand, ten thousand of uh, single one core jobs, please don't do something like that. Put them in the loop of S run. It'll overwhelm Sloan scheduler and kill other people's uh, <clears throat> batch sessions or other people won't be able to submit jobs. And um, there are some workflow tools to help you with this kind of work. Um, they will have a workflow tools page, but I'll just show you one of them as GNU Parallel. So for GNU Parallel, you just load Parallel module, and then you say, I want a sequential one to five with Parallel J2, and then something, right? And then you get actually launched five sequential echo <laughs> job. So this is uh, lots of work tool, uh, workflow tools. Um, 
you can explore and it's definitely better in this example this one is better than task arrays as well and so one question um from michael in the chat is about your slide with the multiple efferons and having only one weight uh, would oh, you yeah. just explain to him why it's only one weight because of this applies to the parallel all um parallel launches Right, uh, the one weight applies to weight for all of these SRAM commands that you have put into the background. And they are being running simultaneously. So if one of them finished sooner than other ones, the weight or wait for the remaining SRAMs. If you forget this weight, then the first one finishes the job of exit. So you may risk the other uh, few SRAM didn't complete. And I also want to show you a, a GPU job script. So lots of, uh, <clears throat> and now you would say that this example actually uses long, long options. SS constraint uh, and other simple one is dash capital C. Um, so that equals GPU here. For um, <clears throat> dash and task per node, CPUs for task is similar to what we have in the CPU side, except now we have a, a total of 128. <clears throat> so two times 64 here, total of 128 logical cores. So this, this little dash C, which is uh, the CPUs per task is to set by physical cores divided by number of tasks per node, get a floor if it's not evenly divisible, then times the, the number of hyper threads two, two times that. <clears throat> this, um, as this formula applies to all the CPU as well. For the CPU side, this, uh, this formula would change here, six, this 64 to be uh, 128 um, here. So here you set GPUs per node uh, uh, for your application in this example. Uh, you also want to do CPU, that's the CPU bind. Um, in this example, we're putting GPU bind equals closest here because by default, um, all processes will have access to all GPUs. So if you wanted to have um, each task to um, only use one GPU um, and also have the best GPU affinity, not to use the far away GPU, for example, so you could add a dash to GPU by equals closest here. Although um, without it, you will see um, each, uh, each C, uh, task seeing all GPUs. With it, you, you'll see um, each task seeing one GPU. Um, there's another way of doing similar things here <clears throat> is uh, I have to have this example in the exercises. Um, so you don't have the GPU bind equals closest in this example, but you are still seeing only one GPU. The way to do this is to set GPUs dash dash GPUs per task equals one. With that setting, you will get one task only uh, per one GPU only per task. <clears throat> but if you even you have this per task equals one, but then if you add GPU bind equals none, at this point, this is equivalent of the previous example that now you see all GPUs by each task. Okay, I want to show you the CPU policy. As I mentioned, we have uh, not only debug, but also regular, interactive, shared, and some other uh, QoS here for CPU and similarly for GPU. Okay. Um, one very, very useful thing for you to check is the job script generator. If you are unaware, unsure what your setting should be, you can just come to the My NERSC page and go to jobs and job script generator, put in the parameters, uh, which architecture, how many nodes, how many threads, um, all the information there, and I'll give you a template for your job script. Same for GPU. Uh, quick slide on how to monitor your jobs. Uh, there's a SQS, it's Nurse Custom Wrapper Script. It basically lists all your jobs with a preset format and columns. Um, you can also use a native Slurm command, um, SQ. And there's also an S account command that you can check or even your completed jobs. SQS and SQ only list jobs um, in the queue. Uh, for S account, you can also query your completed jobs. 
And on the web, we have, you can see the IRS page or the live status page. You can see the Q, the overall Q look as well. The job priorities, you may have, you know, many jobs in the queue. And the first two jobs will be, for the first two jobs of first of, of each QoS per project will be considered by the Sloan Batch Scheduler. The remaining of your jobs will only be considered if they can fit in, uh, we call them backfill, fitting the longer um, holes that when, and when Sloan Scheduler is scheduled in the last, the next highest priority. If at that point, squeezing in your small and short jobs won't affect the scheduling of the next highest priority, your job can backfill and they may run sooner. Yeah, um, so I finished the running jobs section. To, I, I understand it's it's very fast. Um, it's okay if you don't not, not understand every single details. It's just for you to find a way, you know, these things you can look for more information afterwards. So you also answered use CPU cores and GPU at the same time in one job. Yes. Yeah, we, we have that available now that you can request uh, both architectures. So this is the last section before we check the exercises part. On to data analytics software and services. Here's a list of things available. Um, data transfer, um, there's Globus online, there's a Jupyter notebook, no X, no machine. Um, workflows, um, I mentioned Kuno Parallel. Task Farmer is a um, NERSC uh, locally developed tool uh, using one of the nodes as a um, server and the rest of the handle the, uh, the jobs uh, submitted by the user. There are other, um, we have recently just had a workflows to a training with these uh, other tools as well. For data management, HDF, NetCDF, root, and all these database um, category uh, options. For data analytics, uh, Python is very, very popular. Uh, we have R, Spark, Julia, um, MATLAB, Mathematica, TensorFlow, uh, and all these GPU, um, the, the deep learning machine learning tools, TensorFlow, Kara, and PyTorch. For data visualization, we have Visit and Paraview. So um, this is a kind of list. Uh, I'll touch upon a few of these. So I'll show you the Globus Online first. Globus Online is a tool for moving data within NERSC and also from NERSC to other uh, HPC sent DOE um, and high high performance other computer uh, other uh, computing facilities uh, within US and in Europe as well. And for example, uh, we have a NERSC, there are lots of, uh, we call them data endpoints. Um, the NERSC has a data transfer nodes endpoints. Uh, this is highly tuned for just for the data transfer. Uh, for example, Oakridge also has a data transfer node endpoints. And within NERSC, we have uh, NERSC parameter endpoints, we have uh, HPSS endpoints. So and <clears throat> it's a GUI um, interface. And you can set up, you can also even set up a, a Globus Connect personal, like I have a Helen laptop endpoints set up. So you log in with your NERSC um, and MFA as well. And then you could set up a, a origination and destination by logging. And then you can just, uh, you know, checkpoint some of, check um, some of the data or directories. And there's, a, there's like arrow button, you can just start um, transfer data. The good thing is that if it, it'll send you a successful email co uh, confirmation, and if it's got disconnected, um, when you start it again, it'll, it won't start from the beginning, it'll just continue. And it also does in par um, parallel streams. So it's very good for large automated and monitor transfers. If a smaller uh, file transfer is needed or you're all within your own, um, mm, account onto different um, file systems. You can still use the traditional let's copy SCP or rsync. Um, Globus is also good for our small transfers. Uh, within NERSC, we have a, a give and take tool. So you want to give somebody 
a file, a directory you can give dash u that username and the file name, a directory name, and that user will get an email and then they can take from you the file name. Um, if we have external collaborators, uh, we can easily set up web, web portals. The way to do so is that every uh, single nurse project has a, direct, a directory for sharing um, files. It's called global slash CFS, cedar slash your project name. <clears throat> this is this, it's, this section is called community file system, right? So you you have a project directory within the community file system. In the in there, if you set up dash www directory and you can put it index dash HTML or other files there, then instantly you can access them and your collaborators can access them with um, at portal http portal.nurse.gov slash cfs and your project. Of course, you need to set the permissions um, with the for that directory uh, as necessary. Um, if you need more complicated um, uh, portal setup, we call them science gateways. For example, you have a big data set to share with other people, but you, you would like to allow them to do some processing while you dealing with this on the web portal, for example, they can do, they can download a subset, they can do some uh, visualization, all these things. You can set up the science gateway. This is down through Spring service. <clears throat> so we host uh, Spring workshops um, and uh, we, have, we have like four um, this year. So you easily sign up for one. And after the training, we, the staff will work, also work with you on your, um, individual needs to set up your science gateway. Shifter. <clears throat> so you may have heard of Docker. Um, so Shifter is a NERSC um, developed functionality for the, our Cray and HPC Linux systems. For Docker, you can, you know, you build a Docker image and then you can pull onto the public Docker registry and then you can download them or, or uh, <clears throat> pull from you can push to the uh, public registry and then onto another system you can pull and then you get exact same environment um, to run on. Um, the situation with the Docker to be used at NERSC is that uh, users don't have root access, so they cannot uh, push uh, or build the Docker image from our system. So they have to build a um, Docker image on the local machine. And then after that, they can push their image onto NERSC registry shift to registry or onto the public Docker registry so that um, they can be pulled onto those system and users can run with exact same um, environment as they, they locally have. Shift is especially helpful for, for example, for example, Python applications um, because there are lots of uh, shared libraries within Python distribution and your packages, lots of packages you are start on your own. So those libraries needs to be available on compute nodes before it can run. And that usually takes a lot of time overhead. So when shifter and the whole package is like pulled onto compute nodes, all the libraries is already available on the compute nodes, which can reduce uh, runtime significantly. Here's an example, like originally on the scratch luster file system runs five seconds. 500 seconds now with shifter, it runs um, about a quarter of time. And uh, is with a huge um, number of MPI ranks, with it, which is a, it's a big, big job. So the way to create an image, um, this is just a listing sample um, Docker image file. Um, you have a, a from something, a base image, and then you would you know, install your own packages, dependencies, and then copy the application and build it with this. Um, then you would build this image and you push this image to the registry. And then um, when you need to run it, you would in your batch script at this line, my image is this one and I'll pull this image. And you would use shifter as your binary, your application after you module load shifter. So this is pretty simple to use. Uh, NERSC is also moving on to have Podman. Podman actually allows you um, users to be able to build images on parameter logging nodes now. So Podman training is coming soon and we already, already have the documentations. There's the link below. Okay. 
So you're also answering other questions. Do I need to stop to answer some questions? I'm talking about Python next. No, I think we pretty much have it under control. Great, yeah. thank you so much. Okay, Python. Python is becoming more and more popular. Um, all the libraries and as, uh, scientific analysis. And um, Python is used in machine learning, deep learning. And at NERSC, we uh, fully support Python with uh, Anaconda Python environment. And you can also create your own environments, Python. So some of the quick um, tips, do not use Kana init, which are hard code Kana initialization in your shell startup file. Uh, do not use the Python in user being, which is very old. So use module load Python. And this Python is a NERSC build Python so that already includes uh, basic packages, NumPy, SciPy, and MPI for Py. This is a good web page on how to use Python on Perlmutter. <clears throat> Some um, other options. So you can create your own kind of custom environment, uh, kind of you load NOSC Python, kind of create, give it a name and uh, a base. <clears throat> and you can create, um, you can add, add some packages here as well and activate. You can also use Python inside a shifter container. Um, so. You can try to make you an image and think some of the images are nurse provided images that you can find. And for MPI for Pi, uh, it's used for um, MPI uh, parallel, parallel Python. So um, we have a we have a formula for you to follow. So don't do pip install or uh, con install MPI uh, for Pi, but use this. Um, putting uh, the MPI CC uh, flag and also the uh, these two extra flags so that you are not building them inside your dot some file dot local dot file um, with prefixed locations. So it's uh, definitely follow the instructions for how to build Pi for MPI for Pi here. The CUDA aware meaning that um, it knows about uh, the MPI um, libraries are able to communicate uh, among different GPUs without going through CPUs. There are also um, Python uh, of GPU usage. So for example, there's a CuPy, um, the sort of replacement of the NumPy, SciPy, and there's a way to build CuPy with Kana, um, um, create uh, to build uh, your Kupa image as well. There are available um, deep learning, machine learning tools that we have. E we have either the Py the, the Jupyter kernels available, or we also have modules, and we have shifter images for those as well. And if you want to be more um, advanced user to write your own kernels, there are lots of other available Python um, frameworks too. We also have a Py OMP that you can use Modpool. OpenMP threads just in Python, just like usually OpenMP is done in uh, C, C++, and Fortran. So here's a quick example of CuPy, how do you uh, kind of create and with uh, NumPy and SciPy included. After that, you can uh, actually use it on GPU. Um, so let's talk about Jupyter. Jupyter, um, people do use this a lot for live coding. They can do data simulation, visualization, machine learning. It also is um, popularly used in training and tutorials because you have lots of met, uh, markdown sections uh, with instructions. You can have all these, um, people can click a play button and just run it um, step by step. On Perlmutter, these are the um, available notebook servers. So for Perlmutter, you have shared CPU node, exclusive CPU node, um, you can exclusive GPU node, and this configurable job, meaning you can set up uh, reservations or different, uh, more specialized 
specialized fine-tuned settings as well. So you can choose one of those after, after you get onto a server, then start to choose one of the available kernels. So Python kernel is uh, obviously popular. Uh, all these machine learning kernels here, I can see uh, PyTorch, TensorFlow, there's also Julia uh, kernels. And also there are, you can make up your own kernels and it'll uh, um, appear in this options of, of kernel choices when you launch the JupyterHub. So the way to create your own journal, uh, kernel is a very similar as earlier on, but you have to add IPy kernel here and then more app, 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 packages to install here. Then you would run this command, python-m IPy kernel, blah, blah, and then give it a name. And this name is what will be shown in the available kernel in the uh, Jupyter notebook. If you have more advanced settings needs, for example, I want in my kernel, I want to have my some ENV settings, I want to load something there as well. Then what you can do is you could create and uh, edit this file, dot local, blah, 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 and kernel.json and give it a name, use this name and in and then you can provide the details in this um, script here. So with that, uh, you have more advanced uh, customized uh, kernel for yourself. Um, machine learning, deep learning packages, um, as I mentioned, uh, we have libraries available, um, frameworks we had. I think this was a survey done in 2020, what frameworks tools are using. Um, you can see this popular um, orders and uh, we have most of them, most popular ones, of course. Now you can uh, already, I think, mention verbally the module load as well. You can pip install your own packages. Um, here we have pre-installed kernels and we have shipped the images for these um, popular tools as well. And this is, those are some examples. And there's a, um, this is a way to see what is available. So you can search what, what are available. After you search, you can pull the shifter image pull, as I mentioned when, uh, when we talk about shifters. And then the in the batch script, you would dash as batch dash dash image a name and then as one shifter my code. So here as if shifter in front of the executable name, which is Python in these examples. And in you can also use them interactively. And, you can do dash dash image here uh, in the interactive runs. Um, Jupyter for deep learning. Obviously, there's notebooks um, in Jupyter. Yeah. So I really quickly walked through so many topics. <laughs> Are there more questions? Let's definitely save. Um, I'm I'm quickly looking at the the chat. We definitely save those into the Google Docs so we have a complete um, history. And I appreciate Charles and, and Lippy for answering questions. Also, maybe Dan as well. I'm not looking at the Google Docs myself. So, should I go on with uh, exercises? even though we don't have access to the real machine today. That's just an overview at least. <clears throat> Very quick uh, overview. So uh, exercises, uh, what I have is the GitHub, GitHub repo and inside it, I have uh, prepared five examples. So uh, with three CPU and two GPU examples, the first one is hello world basically a very basic uh, compile and run on CPU. And then um, with readme in each of the subdirectories. The second one is uh, you run a hybrid MPI OpenMP matrix multiply code on the CPU again. And the third one is also hybrid MPI OpenMP code, mainly focus on the CPU affinity settings, do sorts of experiments to see what will change with uh, you know, that number of nodes, number of uh, threads or 
and how to set the, the, the dash C value, CPUs per task, and bind CPU bind options. Let's see how the affinity changes. And for the GPU example, I have a build and run and OpenMP target offload on GPU. And then also the GPU for task example is to have the how to build and run a CUDA code on GPU, as well as the with different GPU affinity settings that would, would change. So, so this like basically my last slides, and we're supposed to do some hands on. So let me go, let's go to this directory and we can just walk through of these exercises. Um, so here, this is like this is exercise for the uh, summer student class, also open to NERSC users. So we actually added every one of you to and who has a NERSC account already to the N train three um, N train three um, project, so that you would be able to use the access um, the reserved nodes today. I think actually I do have a slide next. This is a slide <laughs> we had. If we do reservation dash dash reservation, gives a name and the intro CPU or intro GPU and use this account. But um, after so things we're not using this, um, after the training today, if you, you don't have your NERSC account set up yet, you are welcome to apply for a training account. Just still use dash A and train three, but don't put dash dash reservation. Otherwise use your regular um, dash A, your own account, like M2345, something like that. Okay. So here is the first um, hello world example. Um, Read me hello is here. So I said, this is a pure MPI code. Um, you on the login node, you would, because we want to do it for CPU, we recommend you module load CPU. Then I have um, ex example codes in Fortran, serial code and MPI code, also in C and in C++. So these are the commands you would run to choose either one of them to compile on the login node. You can also do it on a computer node. It's just uh, could be slower. And I do recommend you build on login node. And then um, I have prepared a script for you. So you can just run that script and get output. I will show you the script a little bit later. And um, I said in that script, um, it's not within reservation. So if you want reservation, you would add these two lines to your uh, script. Then you can also, if not using the script, you could do an S alloc for the interactive batch. So this is the command line for interactive batch today. And then you would run S run. The S run command would be the same um, as shown in the batch script. So your homework was like exercise was to reproduce the build and run as above. Um, we also I go give you a sample output file there so you can compare with your run. And after that, um, the goal is to you can change uh, number of nodes, number of MPI tasks to run the MPI hello program. To change that, you would modify you know, these values. And then you can notice, notice that the, the uh, output is not ordered. So how do you order them? And I give you another CPU run script. That one is um, having some uh, how to order them in, in that script as well. Um, and if you run a serial hello, uh, you do not need to use S run. You can just run dot uh, serial hello because it's a not MPI job. And then also you may want to try a different compiler. Um, here, um, for example, this is like modular, blah, blah, blah. This is by default, you're using the um, GNU compiler. So here, if you want to use a different compiler uh, with NVIDIA or CCE, you will still use the wrapper, right? But how do you invoke these different compiler? Um, so this um, is inside this batch script. Basically, you would load uh, prgnv-nvidia or prgnv-gnu, uh, not not, uh, and at Cray. So that's the first example. So let me show you a quick hello CPU SSH. So it's very, very simple. Yeah, in this one, you would ask for one node, uh, cap, ask for architecture of CPU, give a time need and a queue OS. That's all you need, basically. Um, my job name is optional. And for the CPU run, you just dash zero, zero, zero hello. 
and for the GPU run, uh, not for the GPU, for the MPI um, hello run, this is your executable you already built and make sure you have these uh, option, but uh, this is based on how many tasks you run on, on this node. In this example, you run 120, uh, you run 64 um, uh, tasks. Actually, the optional and the optimal one should be C4 because it's on CPU. You would divide by 256 divided by 64 here. I think I probably uh, original had a different setting, but um, C2 would still work. Um, or MPI, I'll up, I will update it to use C4 just to be more optimal. So obviously, um, if I show the result for this run, the sample run, you can see, you know, hello from process. This, this is the output from the serial run. And these are output from, you can see hello from process or whatever, it's not ordered. It's somewhat ordered, but also randomly, right? So here uh, in this other script, what I have here is use the default GNU compiler. Um, I am using a, I actually built it inside here. And then I'm using eight MPI tasks per node and dash C is 256 divided by eight. You still have this, you run this executable and you sort it. This is sort by uh, column four of this output. And if I want a different compiler, I only use the Cray here, and then you module load programming memory Cray, and then you build it. I actually, I chose a Fortran code to build, uh, just as an example, and the same command to run it. And this is the output. Use the default GNU compiler, and then you can see these are ordered. This one, this example, I run with eight um, total MPI process. And I'll use the CCE compiler. I didn't put a space in between, so it was like kind of weird. When you do module load PRG and we Cray, it'll actually output something about the, the L module system uh, replacing GCC compiler with CCE. It also replaced PRG and we GNU with PRG and we Cray. And also tells you the Cray and pitch is up reloaded because the original library for MPI was uh, GNU based. Now it's becoming um, CCE Cray compiler based. And then again, the output is uh, sorted. <clears throat> so my Fortran C seems like I have different, uh, I, the C code I have the off eight in my uh, C code. And Fortran doesn't have it. It's because of my source code. I think there's a small text parentheses there. So this is basically the first example. Any questions? <coughs> Not I go on with my second one. Um, I'm gonna need a little clarification from uh, Chuck on his question. He said if you, he asked if I have my own pure C++ CUDA eternal code, would I want a generic instance? By my um, own pure, I would launch a generic instance. Yeah, I think, um, for example, this one, uh, four and five, the GPU, um, actually, the example five is the uh, executable and Okuda code you would launch. Well, exactly, what do you mean by generic instance? I think the same yeah. question I have. Yeah. You would launch your own. I mean, are you saying you want to use your own in the UI. library. Oh, I think we're just linking the application. <clears throat> yeah, sorry, I was uh, looking for what might actually be available on the instance that um, I'm logging into. Uh, as far as the uh, API. Uh, and the uh, CUDA instance, the, uh, the CUDA API that would be available on the instance that I'm logging into. Like, could I compile generic C++ C CUDA code against that? Are you asking about like the default environment? Like what's there? Or are you saying yes. like, if you don't want, did, did we cover the, kind of the module 
like the default module set. I think maybe we did. Yeah, the, the libraries and the uh, NVIDIA uh, CUDA API that's on the system. Mm -hmm. What what so it, what exactly can I compile against there? Oh, you compile whatever application code that you you port to your environment. So you're just talking about linking your own software application. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Yep. You can do that. That's the that's our whole point. Yeah. Sorry, we, we were a little confused about what you were asking, but yeah, that's perfectly fine. You would be able to um, link whatever libraries that we have preloaded for you um, for what's needed for your application and use it that way. If we're understanding what you're asking correctly. Uh, hello, I have a quick question regarding um, if we can do like an interactive job on Chromatter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have interactive and debug queues available for you. Right. Even as Alec, you can say dash queue regular. You just wait time will be really long <laughs> waiting oh, for the session. Oh, I see. Okay, yeah. thank you. And yeah, I totally conquer the comments here about this thing, a huge online tutorial and so condensed quick. Yeah, I we do have longer versions. Uh, I think we're gonna have one in September. We also had one last year in September. It's usually a whole day training. And, <laughs> and we also have some other sessions uh, using Parameter we had had before. We recently had migrating from for Cori to Parameter and um, hands-on as well. So yeah. Today is just for um, a quick, you know, uh, touch touch the spot kind of training for students and for new people. So, you know, where to find, where to dig deeper um, when you need. And if you're overwhelmed and have questions, that's what we're here for. <laughs> Should I go on with the second um, exercise? Go for it. Yeah. So it's the second one is um, matrix. It's just a very simple hybrid MP, open, M, open MP code. So to show you when you still load CPU and use the dash Q open MP for the GCC compilation. And if you use different compiler, uh, you'll use a different flag for open MP. Um, so you, to run it inside a reservation or not, not in the interactive batch, uh, this is an example here. And um, the this application code has the, input here to take as number of OpenMP, uh, MPI tasks and OpenMP. Uh, the um, take this as size of the matrix and number of OpenMP threads here as the input argument for the, uh, for the executable. So all I need to do is um, <clears throat> with four MPI tasks, you, I don't even need to like export OMP number threads equals how much because this is set um, inside the, the, the matrix.c file. But basically um, this output is just a, 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 a generate concrete derivative data, not just hello, M, hello world type, uh, type. So you get this output here and then next time, next we just run with different MPI tasks. And then with this different settings, you will need to change uh, these values here, depending on the number of MPI tasks here. And the uh, I'm, I, in this example, I'm using the same um, size and open MP, but changed the MPI tasks. You can do all sorts of experiments yourself. Um, with with so like if the problem is big enough, uh, this type of uh, experiments would give you some kind of uh, sweet spot finding for your application. Um, so if you, um, there's a batch script inside there and an um, output sample output for this exercise. Um, the goal is to see a real application code and the real data and also uh, adding OpenMP in this example. So if you see matrix.c somewhere, you could see um, text all these um, arguments, right? The number of threads is the one of the arguments. And there's um, inside application here, you would, um, where's the set OMP threads? The MPI stuff beginning. 
it's one of OpenMP code and it has um, this piece was there. I think we should have a OMP thread setting. So, yeah, okay, I'm sorry, I didn't, I missed it. Yeah, so you would set OMP num threads in, inside the batch script here. Um, so here, the output, um, yeah, run these two. So I didn't um, add a script here using a different compiler. Yeah, but if you want to um, use uh, NVIDIA compiler, you use dash MP flag for this ex exercise. So the third exercise is XT high. Um, it's, again, it's a hybrid MPI open MP code. And this code basically reports, if I show you the output, it'll tell you a certain number of MPI rank, what number binds onto which physical or uh, logical cores. So you would compare those results to um, the, the scheme well, I shown or I showed earlier that whether they are on the correct MP and new domain, they're on the correct um, cores so that um, each um, the process are not oversubscribed, no, not undersubscribed. <laughs> so this again, CPU and Q open MP, um, should be F open MP. QOPMP does work too. Um, then we have a batch script. So for example here, I'll use different number of OpenMP threads and proc bind. Proc bind uh, true of spread is best. Spread is better, I'll change it. So you can see the output and also we wanna order them and order them with um, you know two columns because of the OpenMP output and MPI output. And then you would try, let's try with different number of uh, threads, open MP tasks and proc bind to change it to spread or to, um, there's another option to close. And the places options are uh, threads or cores or sockets or also all sorts of settings you can change and use a different compilers. So we have another experiment with a little bit more uh, that done for, for the, these choices here. So let's show you um, an output. So this one is like uh, randomly ordered because it's not sorted. Um, if I show you the batch script here, so you have these settings and you run it without settings. Then if I show this one, So use default uh, GNU compiler when I sort it with column four and six as numerical order. And then with different compilers. So I also have another one with NVIDIA compiler with dash MP build. And um, I changed number of threads also. And now it's uh, now also changed a number of MPI tasks. And then also um, another option run with, with and proc bind equals close with these. So you'll see the output will be different. Let's take a quick look at that. Um, so they should be side by side is better, but at least now it's like, you can see eight MPI tasks in this. I don't know if it's eight or 16, eight MPI tasks total. They're ordered by zero to seven. And then you go back to see um, threads. And also, uh, we have eight threads in the example. So they are pretty much like on, on zero and zero is the first, first physical core. Two is the first, uh, the second physical core because um, no, actually the third one because the physical core numbers are zero, one, two, three, four. This is a skipping one because um, not fully occupied in this example. So there are physical one, a core core one is actually idle, but also um, they're binded to the logical core zero, 
not to zero and 128. 128 and zero are the two logical cores on the same physical core. So you can, you know, check these numbers against the schema to see if they are, you know, evenly distributed as you want it to be. So order them. <clears throat> now you see um, threat rank four, you see the numbers. Um, it's actually get onto this other uh, new, new uh, socket. So here uh, with NVIDIA compiler, this should be the same, um, other, um, not the same. I changed from um, four, four threads, but also um, 16 uh, MPI tasks. So you can also still check those. Then when I change to proc bind equals close, it's quite different from above. See 046, 647 here uh, for the rank one and rank, rank zero and rank one. And again, with 16 MPI tasks and four threads, if I compare with, with spread, you see the um, same, I think I much. I'm the same, try a different pylon calls. Oh yeah, this is still good enough because they are not fully occupied. If I have a lot of threads and when I do close, it'll um, use the second logical uh, CPU instead of a next physical core. So you should uh, be able to try different settings um, and then you will see um, spread and close difference and you will see um, different number and, and ranks, um, the settings difference. So I, um, in my in my example, for example, I have, <clears throat> oh, not this one. So if I have changed it to cores, and you you will see it, it has the uh, logical CPU also binded to. So yeah, when after the after this class, definitely try different different choices and also try this. Try a uh, you know. Uh, um, not an even number. I say it also not give, the reason they are so good is because um, I'm having the C setting. So it saves you lots of trouble. If you set, make the C a, a, a wrong value or, and you were not uh, having all the CPU logical cores being um, binded to, or if you have um, N as an even number, you sometimes you see the affinity getting um, across the, the a physical core boundary or some sometimes you have one thread or task uh, belong to the same and the like two hyper threads on the same physical core being assigned or binded to two different MPI tasks, which is definitely a big disaster. So this is a way for you to make sure to check your um bindings um, for your application. So this this access this code basically would always output Things like hello from this thread and I'm on which um, affinity. This this is the whole purpose of this code. Uh, uh, code. This is a code actually provided by um, HPE, and we have since been using on our HPE system. I think for well, many years now, and I've I adapted to just pure OpenMP or pure MPI, and also this hybrid MPI of OpenMP. Um, the next exercise on GPU. So this is basically a Pi um, target um, code, a Fortran code. <clears throat> and so you have OpenMP target teams distribute parallel do SIMD reduction, <laughs> all of these things basically for this big loop. And so this big loop is supposed to be offloaded to uh, the GPU node. Um, in this example, you would compile a lot mode load GPU and it's already loaded by default. And we recommend you use NVIDIA compiler or Cray compiler. Um, I've shown us in, in the slides. Um, HOMP turn on OpenMP and do not turn on OpenACC, no ACC. And uh, when you run it, you will get a PI, the output. There are a few uh, OpenMP 
environment variable to set to confirm, like for, for NVIDIA compiler, there's a, there's an ACC uh, notify flag, and you can set a level, debug level to a different level. It'll show you actually, I yes, I actually launched a kernel on the GPU for those output. You will see that, but uh, for the simple um, execute default running, it doesn't show these. Um, it'll just tell you my Pi is results correct. <clears throat> so um, I have a sample output as well, and uh, let's take a look at that. Mm -hmm. So this is how you run it. Uh, compile and run, run this. Compile and run, run this. Um, I think I can update uh, this example, putting the uh, the environment variable to check that yes, this uh, code has been uploaded to GPU uh, after this training. I'll do that to confirm. Um, then sample output. I actually I have it in my in my example, and actually it was. It was in my output, it was because I set this thing probably in a session before my S batch. So you see that upload code data, launch code kernel, and then this output. This is on that um, environment variable was set for the NVIDIA compiler. So you don't see it for the for the Cray. For the Cray compiler, um, the original version, the, the earlier versions still has um, the parallel construct. This is a warning, don't worry about it. When you compile, it says um, it uses actually the uh, vectorization SIMD flag. So the um, OMP parallel section for the target load is limited to one single thread, but that's that's not an error. And, and you get output pi and for the Cray compiler run as well. Okay, so the last exercise is GPU for tasks. It's just basically show you a, a Hibakuda code. GPU for tasks, CUDA code. And uh, the purpose of this CUDA code is also to print some GPU affinity section, how many rank, uh, well, how many um, um, GPUs I see and whether the device count name, but this is a CUDA code. So, um, <clears throat> so if you uh, run it, uh, I actually have a two scripts, one of the scripts showing um, all GPU, one of them showing one all, uh, one GPU. This is also have, uh, the batch script I've shown it in the slide. So if you have GPUs per task is equal one, by default, it'll show one GPU with uh, one task will see one GPU. So this is uh, one node, four tasks, four GPUs total, and I only see one GPU. That's how I named it. So here is one node. Uh, tasks, four tasks, um, GPUs per task is equal one, but there's four tasks, so there are a total of four GPUs. And output for this run, so this is my output. I see only one GPU. I'm, I am rank zero out of four processors, I see one GPU, and this is the G, some, some uh, physical address stuff, what I see. For this one, um, the only thing I have added is the GPU bind. I'm not binding anything now and still have one node, four tasks, and total of four GPUs because of one task per GPU. After, by default, uh, without the bind equals noun, when I say GPUs per task equal one, I see one. For, for this one, you see the output. You see now C4. And these are the physical, the, all these four um, GPUs. <coughs> Why <Well, I> had? <coughs> the readme is uh, some uh, as, um, interactive runs here as well as alloc. <coughs> Here I have um, a different compiler. <coughs> GNU compiler and NVIDIA compiler, you have to use dash CUDA to build and same run, but the uh, same results. Yeah. 
and this is the, the seeing one. This example with seeing one without the CPU bind, uh, without the GPU bind equals num flag. So you see one from the uh, GCC one and, um, and, and from the and NVIDIA one. So the exercise are kind of simple. Um, I'm sure your, your, your real applications are much more complicated, but it's just uh, some uh, base of the uh, setting the base for <clears throat> using the <clears throat> affinity settings, CPU bind equals cores. Make sure you have dash C correct and make sure you have the GPU bind however you need to be. And <clears throat> the, the running jobs or performer <clears throat> Websites and <clears throat> application readiness pages have a lot more information for using advanced programming models. And <clears throat> so also the, uh, the <clears throat> hands-on has nothing to, I didn't do Jupyter Notebook, I didn't do <clears throat> deep learning, machine learning. So there are lots of uh, um, information documentation on, on our website as well. When we do a longer version, there will be hands-on exercise. Um, there will be, um, we usually do a whole afternoon of data analytics topics in the past. So I think in the future, we might make break a whole day to be two half days. <laughs> and uh, not, um, well, thank you very much for joining the uh, class today. Hope you get some basic <laughs> concepts or uh, and also excited to do more work on Perlmutter during the summer and for new users um, of over the allocation year, do more work. Uh, very excited <clears throat> for you all to, to be here. And thanks, um, Asni, for organizing it. Thanks, uh, Luke B, Charles, and Dan for answering questions. Thank you, Helen. Well done, Helen. Thank you. Thank you. You stopped the recording, yes? Oh uh, yeah, I'll swap. <laughs> I will stop the recording.